Good day, and it's so good to be here with you today. And thank you for inviting me into your places. So I want to begin by saying this. He is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Today, Resurrection Sunday, what a joyous day of celebration. What a day of rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ, our hope and promise. You know, this is a day that has been settled, uh, which settled the matter once for all. And you might be asking, what matter might that be? I imagine most, many of you would under, understand that. But this is, the, this is what was settled. The power of sin has been made powerless and the chains of death broken. The way maker made a way to, uh, for creation to be reconciled to the creator. Imagine that. The way to the one and only and holy, uh, one and only holy and just God was made for us. Every step of the way, every single brick in the road, every step, every stumble and fumble, every stroke of the whip, every nail in the flesh, every curse, every taunt, every sin taken, received, paid for once for all, the final and the final words, it is finished. So thinking about final words, I'm, not, I'm sure you don't spend too much time thinking about the last words uh, you will one day speak in this life. Most likely, until I just mentioned it, uh, you might have never entertained the thought at all. And that's okay. Yet there are some who have had time to think of what they might say were their last breaths of life. Consider with me, for example, uh, Robert Harris was found guilty of murder in San Diego, California, and executed in the gas chamber on April 12, 1992. Harris' final words, uh, he said, uh, quote, you can be a king or a street sweeper, but everyone dances with the grim, grim reaper. Trying to be somewhat of a poet there, wasn't he? How about Edward Ned Kelly? Now, Kelly was a notorious uh, Australian bush ranger charged with multiple murders and bank robberies. And on November the 11th, 1880, just before he was hanged, Kelly said this, quote, such is life. Then there was Gary Burris, convicted of murder. He was executed by lethal injection on November 20th, 1997. Burris' final words, quote, beam me up. Then there was gang, men gang member Juan Garcia, who was convicted of murder. And, and he said before his execution on October 6, 2015, quote, the harm I did to your dad and husband. I hope this brings you closure. I never wanted to hurt any of you all. And then, and then there was the condemned criminal, who with his final words turned to Jesus and said this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to pick it up in verse 32. And we'll go uh, down to 43. Luke, 32, uh, Luke chapter 23, pardon me, verse 32 to 43. Two, other who were, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to a place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at, the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocking him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There is also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you today for Resurrection Sunday. We rejoice in that. We rejoice and we are thankful. We're so thankful, Lord. We thank you. We just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now that we have read the passage today, maybe you're thinking, hmm, the pastor still thinks it's Good Friday. Should we, should we be worried? Well, don't worry. All is well. I'm very well that we just proclaim together to each other, hey, he is risen, he is risen indeed. But it was shortly after the decision was made to work through our text here in Luke's Gospel that I came across an article by Greg Morris titled, How to Redeem a Wasted Life. And after spending time with Luke's account of the crucifixion of Jesus, I was gripped by Morris's take on the criminal that said to Jesus moments before his death that we just read, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's verse 42. See, Morris takes on the mind and thoughts of the criminal on the cross and speaks from his point of view. I was also motivated to go back to the crucifixion today by a blog that I came across regarding the secularization of Easter in the church. And the premise is that there are two sides to Easter when it comes to the holidays in the church today. One side we have the resurrection of Jesus, on the other side we have the Easter bunny and chocolate eggs. And the blogger asks a good question, why? Why the two sides of Easter in the church? And one reason that was proposed was this was for the sake of money. And of course, the Easter holidays, along with other Christian holidays like Christmas, has become commercialized. And this is often even marketed by the church itself. And the other reason proposed is the decline of religion in the West, especially Christianity, which has also impacted the church in ways that diminish in Easter and a growing number of churches ignore the biblical Easter story altogether. The biblical, key word, Easter story altogether. It's Easter parades with bunnies and chocolate eggs. It's not the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So Morris and this blogger and other reasons have brought us to Luke 23 and the three men on three crosses today. So as we approach our text, Luke's gospel has provided the events leading up to Golgotha. So from a bird's eye view, we find that Jesus had arrived at Jerusalem six days before the Passover. And from there, Jesus' prophetic pronouncements on Jerusalem and the nation of Israel to what we call today the Last Supper, communion. And from the time Jesus spent preparing his disciples, the disciples abandoning Jesus in the garden uh, at his arrest. From Jesus' betrayal by Judas to Peter's denial of Jesus from the decision of the kangaroo court to the governor's palace, from Pilate to Herod, and then back again to Pilate from Herod, from Pilate's decision to have Jesus crucified in order to keep the peace in the city and to save his job, to the crucifixion of Jesus and two, criminal, uh, and two criminals, one on each side of Jesus. Now everything has been said that was to be said, and all that was left was the final words of three condemned men on a bloody cross. Words that would take the very last bit of strength in their bodies and the very last bit of air in their lungs to speak out. As we look across these 11 verses before us, we find a, a variety of reactions to the scene. Uh, from curiosity to mourning. Verse 27, if you look at that, tells us that a great multitude of people followed the procession to the place called the Skull. And as the procession uh, made its way from the governor's palace, the curious would join the crowd. Verse 27 also reveals that women were mourning and lamenting for Jesus along the way. We also find indifference and malice toward Jesus. The hatred of the religious rulers of Israel toward Jesus put the voice for us here in verse 36. So you can look at that. It tells us there, the ruler scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Others taunt Jesus as well. The Roman soldiers overseeing the crucifixion were told, we are told, cast lots to divide his garments. Uh, verse 34, that's in fulfillment of Psalm 22, verse 18. My friends, this was not an act of kindness. They even mock him in the next verse. This is not an act of kindness, but one of us settled knowing that no one gets down from the cross alive and might as well divide up the spoils by gambling. And then one final taunt comes from uh, the two dying criminals. Here, was, uh, here were two men who wouldn't think twice before cutting someone's throat for a denarius, for a dollar, for a penny. And we find one here in the text moments from breathing his last 
re, uh, thinking only of himself and his own skin as he hurled abuse at Jesus and said in verse 39, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Three taunts. Three taunts, as someone said, quote, dealing with the issue of Jesus' saving activity. Well, the year was 1936, and Dale Carnegie wrote what would become one of the best-selling books of all time, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Over 30 million copies have been sold worldwide, and today continues to sell in excess of 250,000 copies a year. When we survey the scene here in our text in Luke's, in Luke's Gospel, someone might wonder, where did Jesus go wrong? Here was Jesus surrounded by scoffers and a mockery. Jesus, this is not the way to win friends and influence people. Jesus was suffering and in great pain. So the question, who, question is, who were Jesus' last companions on earth? Robbers and murderers and Roman executioners. Jesus the day before, Jesus the day before, as the Last Supper was drawing to a close, said to his disciples this in Luke 22, 37. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And then he quotes Isaiah 53, 12, which we read as he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus' last companions on earth were the transgressors, the sinners, the transgressors who the criminal beside Jesus said were receiving the due reward of our deeds. Verse 41. I wonder if you see the irony, because it's dripping all over this place. Transgressors, transgressors offer indifference and malice, and in return, Jesus, Jesus offers what? Compassion. Jesus prays and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verse 34. Do you remember what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount concerning our enemies? Do you remember? Matthew 5, 43 to 44. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What? Why? Jesus said, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Why? Jesus said, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Here was Jesus with his final words, offering compassion, forgiveness, and love to his enemies. And what we see here is a glimpse, a screenshot of Jesus, who now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven, interceding for you and me night and day to our Father. And may I be bold to say for our enemies as well. Well, friends, for the rest of our time, uh, we want to be focused on verse 40 to 43. And our focus is here a criminal, a robber, and a murderer justly condemned to death on the cross. Our focus here is another who was unjustly condemned to death on the cross. One who was judged and accused of being a revolutionary deserving death on the cross. Consider the robber. Eyes staring at his naked and broken body. He hated them. Why did there have to be so many present? But there was some luck on his side because he wasn't the main target of the ridicule and contempt. Who was this they hated so much in the middle? He was playing second fiddle to this guy, and he hated that even more. But he had heard about this man claiming to be the Messiah. Some Messiah. Hey, you, yeah, you in the middle, who call yourself the Messiah. Save yourself. Man, you can't even save your own bacon. Some Messiah. The ridicule, ridicule and mockery continued toward the man in the middle. Then something began to happen. Something began changing. Maybe it was that his enemies had said this. He saved others. Verse 35. Could this really be the Christ of God, his chosen one? Maybe if he saved others, could he save me? Maybe it was what he saw. The women weeping for him. The crowds surrounding the crosses. His enemies insulting him. Who is this man beside me? Something began changing. What about the sign above his head? Etched in wood in three languages. This is the king of the Jews. Could this man really be the king of the Jews? What else could explain the three hours of darkness in the middle of the day? 
the blackening of the great light in the sight of his death. Something was changing. For he said to those mocking and scorning in prayer, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My response to the onlookers was to curse them. This man nailed to the cross prayed for their forgiveness. Who is this calling God his Father? Maybe, just maybe, could it be, if it at all possible, that I could be forgiven for my life of waste, forgiven for my own sins? Everything changed. The other man beside the man in the middle cursed him. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But before he could object, before he could say another thing, he said to the fellow on the other side, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 41. Friends, we live in a time in the evangelical church where many are only interested, interested in having their ears tickled. And many who stand up and represent Christ are more than willing to give them what they hear. The Apostle Paul put it this way to his dear friend and fellow pastor Timothy in his second letter, chapter, three, chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. He said this, For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. But having itching ears, pardon me, will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passion and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Let me ask you, do you think that the man on the cross beside Jesus was hoping Jesus would improve his family relationships? That his money problems would improve? That he would have a successful life? That Jesus would take him down from the cross, clean him up and give him his best life now? How about you? in the darkest places of your life, in the pain and destruction of your sin. Do you want someone to show you how to improve your life? Make you a better person? Are you so selfish to think that God would send his only son to the cross to make you rich and prosperous? And then when that doesn't happen in your hard hearts of hearts, you look heavenward and say, are you not the Christ? Save me? Friends, the Apostle Paul said to the Roman church, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. We should all know that one. You see, when I survey this scene, when I look at it and ponder and think about it, I see myself in the crowd. I see myself joining the rulers and saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. I see myself casting lots for his garments and mocking Jesus. I see myself on one side of Jesus saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us. Where do you see yourself? My friends, I'm not here to scratch your ears. The Bible won't let me do that. And if you haven't gone to the cross, then you will not understand the joy of the resurrection that we celebrate today. And if you want to have your itching ear scratched, there are plenty of folks that are more than willing to accommodate you. But I beg you, I beg you to consider what the criminal, with his final words, came to understand. He knew everything had changed. He was guilty, but Jesus wasn't. He was judged rightly and condemned. Jesus wasn't. He was worthy of death, but Jesus wasn't. He had wasted years of breath to come to his final words with his final breath. And with a gasping breath, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned his torn face to him and said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And today, this unnamed former robber, murderer, and God reviler joins the company of people like Rahab the prostitute, David an adulterer and murderer, Peter the Jesus denier, Paul the persecutor of Christ, and an untold multitude in heaven who, like the Apostle Paul put it, were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of their souls. Friends, in closing, I want to share you, with you what Pastor Alistair Begg once said in a sermon. There, Pastor Begg imagined the thief on the cross arriving at the portals of heaven and there interviewed by an angel who asked, 
him this, what are you doing here? And he replied, I don't know. And the angel said, what do you mean you don't know? And he replied, I mean, I don't know. The angel responded, well, uh, well uh, I got to go get the supervisor. So the angel goes and gets the supervisor, comes back with the supervisor angel, who said to this one, just a few questions for you. Are you clear on the doctrine of the justification of faith? And he replied, I have never heard of it in my life. And the supervising angel said, and, and what about, in, frust in frustration, said, okay, let's go straight to the doctrine of Scripture. And the guy stares back, nothing. And again, out of frustration, the supervisor angel asks, on what basis are you here? And he replied, the man on the middle cross said, I could come. Father, I thank you. I praise you and I thank you for Resurrection Sunday. For the man on the middle cross made it all possible. I praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless. Shalom.